So, okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back to the third session of the Kitchen Power National Parallels Symposium. And again, this morning, I'm Sir Sir Brian still, um, I'm going to hand over to Professor David Crowley from NCAD, who's going to chair this session, which is about um, science and modernity in West Germany and the United States. So thank you, David, you take over. Thanks, Sosha. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to those of you who are here for the first time and those who are coming back. As Sosha says, this is the third session of this international symposium, which is exploring design um, and the social and cultural practices that we might uh, associate with what we might call the modern kitchen, that commodified, that spectacularized space of domestic labor and sociality, which is plugged into networks of power, often very literally in the 20th century. Um, and it's perhaps a place in the home which was subject to more scrutiny and study in the mid 20th century than at any other time. So it's really uh, fantastic to have this moment to think about that. Uh, the events organized by Saoirse O'Brien in close collaboration with her colleagues in the National Museum of Ireland. And it's, it's an event that's attached to a long research project that Saoirse has been undertaking, which is to explore the kind of promises and the realities of the rural electrification scheme in Ireland and that's resulted in an exhibition called Kitchen Power which is in, um, in uh, the museum, the National Museum of Ireland in its country life branch in Mayo. Um, so Saoirse has organised this event to allow for international parallels to be drawn for that Irish material to be put in a kind of wider context and if we needed any evidence, any evidence at all of the significance of the modern kitchen in design and social historical scholarship, well, it's, it's surely found in the quality of the excellent research that it attracts. And we're really fortunate to have over these two days some of the, the best researchers in this area speaking at this online symposium. And today we have a theme which is focusing on um, science and modernity in West Germany and in the United States. And we have Barbara Penner and Sophie Gerber uh, to present talks. And the format's going to be like this. Um, each speaker will speak for perhaps around 20 minutes or so, and then we'll, um, we'll come back together and have a kind of discussion session. You're very welcome to use the Q&A button that you can see at the bottom of your screen if you want to make comments or questions as we go. That would be excellent, that would help a lot. But of course, you can also do that um, at the end of the session. We'll gather those questions and we'll open it up into discussion. So I'd just like to make a more specific introduction to Barbara Penner, who's Professor of Architectural Humanities at the Bartlett in London. I'm sure you know is a very prolific writer, prolific researcher, who's really done a lot to help us think about the spaces of leisure, of retail, of domestic life in the 19th and 20th centuries. And in her work, there's always a strong focus on the relationship of architecture and design to the body thinking about social bodies, gendered bodies, and so on. And for me, her work's important because it's also played a part in what we might want to call the kind of infrastructural turn in architectural history and theory in recent years to help us think about how lives are sustained, but also kind of managed through unseen or often unremarked features of, of our urban life, the, the infrastructures that surround us. She's a very prolific writer. I won't pull out all of her titles, but Bathroom's been a very influential book. Um, she's written about um, honeymooning in 19th century America in Newlyweds on Tour. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear her talk today about the Cornell Kitchen, which is a, a kind of key moment in the history of ergonomics, a field which really calls out for much more critical analysis. You know, ergonomics is often um, thought about in quite simplistic terms, so I'm really uh, excited to hear today's talk. So, Barbara, are you able to switch on, become visible, and I'll, I'll, I will disappear. So, Barbara, welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, thank you for that extremely generous and kind introduction. Um, I'm assuming that my uh, presentation is now visible. Yes, looks good. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you also to Sorsha for the invitation to speak today about what is uh, surely my favorite subject, uh, which is kitchens. 
And as David said, today I will be speaking about one kitchen in particular, the Cornell Kitchen, designed between 1950 and 1955 at Cornell University in America. So one of the reasons why the kitchen interests me is because it was produced um, as part of a university-based research project, and it was um, collectively produced by a team that included home economists, uh, engineers, architects, and also a psychologist. And the kitchen was extremely ambitious, promising to deliver modernity to users in a single shot, combining rational design, the latest technologies, and aesthetic appeal in one prefabricated package. Um, right. Its synthetic vision really made the Cornell Kitchen something of a media star in the mid-1950s, and it garnered tremendous interest and publicity in America and also abroad in Canada, uh, the UK, Scandinavia, and Italy. Yet it never achieved its principal aim uh, as set out by its mastermind, the head of Cornell's Housing Research Center, economist Glenn H. Beyer, and we see Beyer here. Um, Beyer believed uh, very firmly that housing research along scientific lines could improve people's lives. This belief that scientific methods could help solve complex environmental problems like housing was widely shared in the late 1940s at a time when the family and the home were seen as the building blocks for post-war stability and also prosperity. However, Sorry. Um, however, Bayer also and more unusually believed that housing researchers had to do more than simply issue design guidance or rewrite architectural standards. Housing researchers had to embed their findings in mass produced designs which could be sold direct to consumers. As Bayer put it, research had to take on form and substance. And this really became the mantra of the Cornell Kitchen project, form and substance. So today we'll consider how Cornell Kitchen took on form and substance. And then we will also uh, examine why it was never mass produced. A failure, I suggest, is that's revealing in ways that still matter to us now in our own age of impact. As was well covered by the speakers uh, yesterday, uh, the tradition of researching home kitchens in order to rationalize them has a long history. It goes back to the late 19th century. Kitchen studies were carried out by home economists in order to alleviate the drudgery of women's household labor, the so-called dreary treadmill. In America, Cornell's College of Home Economics emerged as a powerhouse of kitchen research from 1900 into the 1940s and the 1950s. And I'm sharing with you here 
some of the many kitchen publications that Cornell issued in the post-war period. And you can see that these were really aimed at thrifty farmers, wives, um, and they had this strong emphasis on self-reliance and do-it-yourself DIY. For instance, in the middle right here, uh, we see a man building his own kitchen cabinets. So Cornell Kitchen didn't come from nowhere. It worked from the home economists, well-established research principles, and adopted their design and planning principles. For instance, it adhered to their inside out mode of design, which began with information and data. And the Cornell Kitchen kicked off with this large survey of 700 farm families that identified facts such as the average family stores a 25-pound bag of flour or six bread and butter plates. And this information was important because Cornell Kitchen aimed to hold everything an average family might need in the kitchen, from food to utensils to appliances in these five distinct work centers, which followed a logical workflow, uh, beginning with storage, moving to food preparation, and then to service. Again, the work center concept had long been a staple of home economists' kitchen plans, as had this overall aim of rationalizing workflow. After this data collection exercise, which helped to establish user needs and dimensions, the Cornell Kitchen team moved onto a design phase with engineers from the nearby College of Agriculture the team went through um, three main design iterations, each built at a one-to-one -one scale and then tested in use. And uh, just to point out this nice detail here, you'll see that the sink is height adjustable to, to suit the user. And these testing methods, again, were standard features of the Home Economist's toolkit. Um, so the Cornell Kitchen researchers made use of trip distance mapping, uh, oxygen consumption studies. Maria also showed some of these um, uh, being carried out at the Swedish Home Research Institute yesterday, and micro-motion studies. And all of these various tests were undertaken with the aim of establishing optimal layouts and dimensions, which would save energy and steps for a woman of average height and reach. And for the purposes of the testing phase, it was assumed that an average woman was five foot four inches. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit here to the final design, but we see that this desire to save energy and uh, spare uh, housewives from fatigue did really substantially shape the kitchen's final design, which everywhere sought to reduce stooping and reaching through features such as waist-high appliances, like this waist-high oven, and also um, this horizontal range. Uh, sliding panels and sliding trays were introduced again to um, reduce reaching 
and you see sliding trays are even introduced into the fridge. Um, and also another innovation uh, was these pocket style doors, which could be tucked away and this would leave the central workspace um, free of any obstacles and um, allow easier circulation. And most radically of all, thanks to these aluminum vertical spacers, which could be stacked one on top of the other, the centers could be adjusted depending on the height of their main operator and in this way increase user comfort. So in significant ways, Bayer really did seem to go along with the home economists' rational user-centered model. But with the second iteration of Cornell Kitchen, we begin to see how his market orientation is also pulling him away from it. When this design was exhibited at Cornell's Farm and Home Week in 1952, visitors were asked about appearance. Did they like how the kitchen looked? Home economists usually avoided discussions about aesthetics because they worried that fashion distracted from function. But to buyer, looks mattered. If you wanted a design to sell, it had to be visually appealing. And to ensure Cornell Kitchen would be aesthetically cutting edge, for the third iteration of the kitchen's design, Bayer brought in architect Frank Weiss, who trained at Harvard's Graduate School of Design with two high priests of modernism, Marcel Breuer and Walter Gropius, uh, the silver fox himself. And Weiss's impact is immediately apparent in the perspectives he produced for the Cornell Kitchen Bulletin, published in 1953, just before the um, third iteration of the kitchen was finalized, showing a kitchen that owed far less to rural upstate New York and far more to California's case study program. Gone were the boxy forms of the home economists. Everything was sleeker, more geometric, sharply angled. So we have these very distinctive uh, Cadillac style fins. And significantly, there is no pegboard in sight. The hiring of Weiss also signaled that Bayer was serious about moving away from the home economist's preference for home carpentry towards prefabrication. Previously, home economists had always issued working drawings for all their kitchen designs so that homeowners could build kitchens themselves. And, and I, I'll return you to um, this image of a home carpenter at work. By not making working drawings available and industrially manufacturing the Cornell kitchen, at a stroke, buyer transformed rural homeowners into consumers. So the model was now that they would purchase work centers, which would arrive flat packed for assembly at home. So there was still some home labor involved. 
And these uh, work centers could be arranged in various configuration to suit existing spaces. Um, and, and they could be added incrementally as well as money became available for their purchase. The flexibility, choice, and also the cost efficiency of the prefab system was always highlighted in Cornell Kitchen's literature, probably in part to win over rural remodelers uh, who may well have felt some resistance to it. But however much flexibility was offered, we shouldn't forget that the Cornell Kitchen was also very highly prescribed in a way that took away choice. Everything one would supposedly need for kitchen work was already supplied. It was built into these work centers from cutting boards to storage bins to lighting. And courtesy of General Electric, electrical appliances came pre-installed along with electrical outlets at a time when electrical appliances were by no means universal in farm kitchens. Um, in fact, gas tended to be preferred at this time for reasons of cost. Um, and interestingly, the first iteration of the Cornell kitchen had actually used a wood burning stove. What rural consumers were buying when they bought a Cornell kitchen then was a superstructure designed to deliver electrical modernity in a single shot, bringing them technological parity with their urban and suburban counterparts, whether or not they wanted it. As in the Irish cases, which Sorsha discussed yesterday, the immediate justification for upgrading farm homes in this way was to counter the migration of rural inhabitants to cities. No doubt why Cornell produced publicity always stressed the kitchen's potential to defend and to sustain rural home life. In publicity photos like these, or like these, the kitchen was depicted almost as if it was a biopolitical command center from which the housewife could meet not only the physical, but also the uh, social and emotional needs of her family. And I think it's significant that she is depicted not only as a worker, but also as a manager of her family's needs. Whether or not the Cornell Kitchen could deliver on these uh, grandiose promises, its design was very well received by its target audience. Visitors who saw the kitchen on display, as well as the five families who live tested the kitchens in their homes. Um, and in this poll of 2,800 visitors to Farm and Home Week, in 1954, you see that the built-in lighting, sliding cabinet trays, adjustable countertops, and waist height oven all won the very strong approval of over 80% of those who saw it. And looking at such positive feedback, buyer might have been forgiven for thinking that corporations would line up for the chance to produce 
and sell it and enthusiastically supported by Cornell, Bayer did make a very concerted effort to sign up licensees for the kitchen's patent, getting furthest with Westinghouse, which paid at least uh, $50,000 for partial rights. But the way Westinghouse ultimately adapted the Cornell Kitchen speaks volumes about the difficulties of translating designs into the commercial market. While Westinghouse's deluxe uh, confection kitchen shared initials with Cornell Kitchen and also shared certain features, um, the waist high electrical appliances, and also sliding trays. It was a long way from Cornell Kitchen's modular and flexible design. Gone also was Weiss's erector set aesthetic, replaced by cabinets like fine furniture more suitable for open plan suburban living. And this reminds us that rural consumers would never on their own be a big enough market to tempt a company like Westinghouse. And most tellingly perhaps, gone were the Cornell Kitchen's most user-centered or ergonomic features. While firms like GE were happy to adopt features that enhanced consumer choice, uh, such as mi mix and match colors for cabinet doors, they didn't like features like height adjustable countertops, which meant that a kitchen could potentially be adapted for changing user needs. Instead, corporations like GE and Westinghouse remained deeply invested in the model of planned obsolescence with its cycles of ripping out and replacement um, as discussed by the journalist uh, Vance Packard in The Waste Makers, for instance. And this really exposes the weakness of buyer's market-oriented approach. Key elements of the Cornell Kitchen's program and priorities were fundamentally at odds with those of the commercial market. To this day, um, companies or commercial kitchen manufacturers continue to prefer more fixed and standardized designs. Um, and in this uh, great article, uh, the author laments the fact that most work, worktops in commercial kitchens are still fixed at 36 inches, too high for the average woman. And for all of these reasons, I regard Cornell Kitchen as something of a cautionary tale for us today when we as researchers are increasingly pressed to justify our projects in terms of impact as embodied by the dreaded pathways to impact statement that now is a routine part of most grant application forms. And I do believe that this is a question that deserves more discussion and reflection. How do university researchers in the design fields best achieve real world impact? And how do we do this ethically within a system that still often aims to redefine users as consumers? Thank you.
Oh, but thank you very much. Uh, we're all applauding very loudly at this one. <laughs> <laughs> and I think your, um, thank you. your final words were very resonant, thinking about the capacity for universities to be critical spaces. So uh, thank you very much for that. We're going to move straight away to uh, Sophie's talk and uh, then we'll gather questions at the end. People haven't used the Q&A function yet, but please do if you'd like to as we go. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to introduce uh, Sophie Gerber, who's a, a curator and a researcher in the Technical Museum in Vienna. And her area of expertise as a curator is in the, the design and material culture of everyday life. And as many of you will know, the Technical Museum has a really uh, remarkable collection and a very compelling display, which I think put a spotlight on on sort of technology and the body really in quite a quite an early moment in our thinking about this and that Sophie presently is is leading thinking and research on how to tell LGBTQ plus histories within museums like science and technology museums or how existing collections might be queered so really important and pressing challenges I think. Um, she has a, an excellent publishing record in STS and in fact her presentation today takes her back to the subject of her 2014 book, Kitchen Refrigerator Kilowatts, the history of private energy consumption in Germany, 1945 to 1990. Um, and today I think she'll focus specifically on, I suppose, the period of the economic miracle and help us think about the modern kitchen in West Germany from 1957 to 1972. Sophie, um, welcome. Well, hello everyone. I hope you can uh, see and hear me now. Um, yes, uh, thanks a lot for having me and uh, Sasha and for the fantastic talk so far. Thank you also, David, for the introduction. Um, as you've already mentioned, I'm going to present some findings from the research I've made for my doctoral thesis some years ago uh in the history of technology and at first i have to apologize because of my device it seems it is not possible uh, to have my screen shared and the video turned on at the same time so i'm going to be invisible now but uh, we'll see each other again during the q a so i hope you can see my presentation in a few moments Okay, I hope this works. Perfect, thank you. Good, thanks. So, uh, I chose to have a closer look at what I call the long 1960s, so the years between 1957 and 1972, because during these 15 years, the consumption of electric goods, especially household equipment, and electricity gained incredible momentum in West Germany. I'm referring to West Germany and as Germany from now on just um, to mention that because I want to distinguish this from the federal, uh, no, the German Democratic Republic. So manufacturers, utility companies and national politics contributed to the steady increase of seemingly infinite power supply and carefree electricity consumption. And in the next uh, minutes, I will explore the dynamics of domestic electricity consumption especially in the kitchen before the oil crisis of the 1970s. Uh, in a chronological way, I will focus on the agents of growing electricity consumption and their strategies. Based on material from Berlin's electricity supplier, Bewerk, appliance manufacturers such as Siemens, and the professional magazine, The Modern Kitchen. Uh, this is a very broad approach, but uh, I hope to give you a bigger picture and to illustrate how the kitchen and consumers became a part of an electricity intense network and crucial for the high energy regime we still live in today. So I'm going to start some years earlier. Shortly after the Second World War in 1946, Berlin already opened its first information center and training kitchen, teaching consumers about appropriate energy consumption in times of limited electricity supply. Hence, electricity companies did not advertise more, but less consumption. 
But as early as 1947, Bewerk used promotional cars, even though Berlin was still in ruins. Uh, you can see this on uh, the left hand side in the picture in the top right corner, you can see uh, the ruins of Berlin. As soon as the rationing of electricity had come to an end in 1948, utility companies aimed at increasing their sales using the slogan, take advantage of electricity. They produced more and more electricity, so they focused on creating consumers desire for it, organizing cooking shows, electricity education programs and exhibitions. A lot of creative effort was put into the decoration of window displays um, in Bayworks information centers. You can see uh, two examples here on the slide. Uh, rhyming slogans were popular, as well as comparisons between the dirty and exhausting old times and the modern, convenient and electrified 1950s. Also, the housewife's revolution was proclaimed and their slogan was clear, we want to live electrically. And as we've seen in the presentations yesterday, the target group were women or housewives, preferably wearing an apron. Only sometimes men were addressed as the breadwinners or professionals. An exemplary picture um, we can see it on the slide. Um, it says like, uh, it's the French cooking artist, Monsieur Dupont picture, and he says magnifique, uh, so yeah. The advisory and education programs became more and more popular. In the business year of 1957-58, Bewerk conducted 282 cooking courses with about 4,200 participants and almost 7,000 home visits. Advertisements aimed less and less at mediating the understanding of technology and instead shifted towards abstract characteristics and emotional as well as experiential values. In the case of electricity, values such as modernity, freedom, leisure and progress were linked to electricity and advertisements, constructing the idea of the modern home. Discourses on modernity, prosperity and progress from the pre-war period were reweaved during the era of reconstruction and linked to the consumption of electricity. In general, the advertising strategies had already been known before World War II. Earlier discussions about the rationalization of the domestic workplace and the kitchen in the interwar period had created desires for domestic appliances that embodied certain lifestyle concepts and cultural notions, even though most consumers could not yet afford them. But in contrast to the late 19th and first half of the 20th century, when lighting and small appliances had been dominant in advertising. In the 1950s, bigger appliances, such as ovens and refrigerators, were the main focus of interest for consumers and producers. But that electricity was available did not mean that it was affordable for everyone, even in Germany's economic miracle era. For the post-war generation, SWIFT was still the first priority and skeptical consumers had to be convinced to invest in expensive electric appliances for their homes. Therefore, for example, Bewerk emphasized that, quote, electric has nothing to do with luxury. To give something electrical as a present will be rewarded. Electric appliances save time, money and work. Of course, these arguments are well known. Consumer campaigns were also initiated by German politics, such as the refrigerator campaign in 1953, which was declared the year of the consumer, followed in 1955 by the campaign Erhard Helps the Housewife, launched by the then Minister of Economic Affairs, Ludwig Erhard. German politics unreservedly embraced the American model of the resource and energy intensive forest consumption regime as an ideal. For example, with the exhibition America at Home, um, you can see um, um, the brochure for the exhibition on the slide. The electric industry supported the political efforts 
because they rediscovered private consumers and their energy consumption as a means to balance the daily load curves of power plants. Moreover, they recognized that low promotional electricity prices were the best way to promote private energy consumption and therefore increase their sales. Quote, electricity has to be as cheap as possible to ensure the highest profits. The efforts of energy suppliers and politics, so just to um, mention them again, advertising and education, exhibitions, consumer campaigns, decreasing electricity prices, a wider variety of domestic appliances, increasing income, the rise in women's employment, and more limited space per person. All of this had the desired effects. While about 1 million and 800,000 electric stores had been in use in Germany in 1949, sorry, <coughs> this number tripled by 1960. And while in 1954 only 8% of German households kept their food in an electrical fridge, 11 years later this figure had already reached 74%. Domestic electricity consumption also more than tripled during the 1950s. These numbers illustrate the emerging establishment of a high energy mentality in Germany during the 1950s. For consumers, the decade was crucial for the development of long-lasting convictions and consumption patterns. Until the 1960s, the general electricity euphoria continued and even expanded in the context of the popularization of nuclear energy. Massive advertising efforts for electricity and domestic appliances transformed electric energy into a cheap mass product and thus promoted the careless consumption of it and appliances as well. Because the employee of the local energy supplier who came to the house every month to read the electricity meter soon became a thing of the past, consumers gradually lost touch with the amount and cost of their energy consumption. By relocating energy production facilities to power stations far away, domestic energy consumption was decoupled from generation. Electricity was apparently available without problems, without consequences, and endlessly via the electric socket. This matter, of course, which developed into a real energy oblivion, became a problem in the 1970s. But at the end of the 1950s, electricity sold effortlessly but appliance and electricity producers wanted even more, both aimed at the all-electric household. Moreover, around 1960, consumption patterns in West Germany changed. Consumers' need for prestige brew and electric appliances became an important factor for their conspicuous consumption to cite Torsten and Weblon here. Moreover, ideas of comfort and hygiene standards became more important and more and more Germans were dreaming of their own house. The industry responded to changing consumer habits, while at the same time shaping these habits by offering decreasing prices and a variety of new appliances. Soon, many households were equipped with white goods, such as washing machines, electric stove, and fridges. So the industry had to develop new strategies to tap into new markets and encourage even more energy consumption. They discovered small appliances, cosmetic appliances, and air conditioners as a market niche, as well as freezers, dishwashers, and electrical heating appliances. You can see um, some from the collection of uh, the Vienna Museum of Technology here on the slide. Electric heating became more and more popular, mm -hmm. not least because off-peak electricity got even cheaper. You do not heat, you make yourself at home was the slogan of a large advertising campaign for night storage heaters with reduced electricity rates in 1962. In 1966, the increase in household expenditure on electricity and other fuels was well below the average increase in the total cost of living. And in 1967, there were up to 300 different electrical appliances for domestic use on the market. As the post-war backlog demand was gradually covered in the early 1960s, household appliance manufacturers also increasingly focused on the market for higher quality products, replacement and second appliances. The overall economic recession of 1966-67 
was of little consequence for the electricity and electrical industry, as the long 1960s proved to be a decade of unrestrained consumption of electrical appliances and electricity. Electricity had become indispensable and had never before enjoyed such popularity. So not the period of the economic miracle between 1948 and 1957, but the following years until 1972 were the golden years for household electrification in Germany. While electricity became an affordable mass product, the anti-consumption and environmental sorry, movement of the 1960s emerged. Consumers began to worry, but were told by electricity advisors to reconsider their concerns in favor of electricity sales. On the surface, the industry acknowledged the looming environmental crisis, but at the same time, they created fear of a gap in supplies among consumers while positioning themselves as reliable and trustworthy energy suppliers. It became clear that despite all concerns, German households were strongly integrated in large technical systems, such as the power network, depending on high energy consumption and well-equipped kitchens. Shortly before the first oil crisis, the growing dependence on high electricity consumption in German households became apparent. Quote, we live in the age of electricity. People are becoming increasingly dependent on it. Without it, a proper life today and in the future would be unthinkable so the industry. The equipment of households with electric appliances increased rapidly until 1971, while 42 percent out of well, 42 out of 100 households had owned an electric stove in 1961 and 47 had owned a refrigerator. Maybe I come back to the graph here. This number rose to 63 electric stoves and 88 refrigerators in 1973. Those who did not yet have the, what the industry called standard equipment, so um, a Hoover refrigerator, kitchen machine and washing machine, and wanted to be considered modern, they had to hurry up, according to the industry, because soon the next machines, such as ironing machines, dishwashers and freezers, not to mention the other little things, were on the rise. The kitchen industry experts were sure that the lack of space was a decisive reason for customers to decide against buying an electrical appliance. Uh, therefore, um, I also want to um, address the question of kitchen design briefly, um, at least I try, before um, I'm going to conclude. The question of the so-called modern kitchen, whether it be a work, a dining or a living kitchen, a factory or living space, was intensely discussed by kitchen experts and architects during the 1960s. Up until the interwar period, the combination of kitchen and living room was the center of family life without taking into account efficient work processes, except for visionary examples such as the Frankfurt kitchen. But there were different views on building policy and kitchen equipment in the reconstruction era. The kitchen to live in was even signed as a sign for an emergency flat. There was also talk of an anachronism. On the one hand, by means of rationalization and time and movement studies, the former eat-in kitchen was to become the housewife's workplace. On the other hand, the idea of the kitchen as a laboratory and the comparison with the workplace had misjudged the much broader function of the kitchen in the eyes of many kitchen experts. Kitchen work was not monotonous, repetitive assembly line work, but creative work that required a co correspondingly large amount of space and equipment. But the situation was not ideal. First of all, according to female kitchen professionals, there was a need of women's participation in housing construction. Primarily, male architects had no understanding of the female perspective on kitchen planning, quote, even with the best intentions, men could never experience what it means to work as a housewife. Architects, on the one hand, depended on female advice. On the other hand, they had to react to limited possibilities. Flats after the war were only 50 to 65 square meters with two and a half to three rooms, which allowed only for kitchens of not more than six to eight square meters. 
Swedish and American kitchens with standardized built-in furniture were regarded as models for the German kitchen visionaries. The Arbeitsgemeinschaft Moderne Küche, Modern Kitchen Consortium, even considered, quote, the ideological principles of a better life in the kitchen realized in the Swedish kitchen. And a German newspaper was enthusiastic about the new kitchens from abroad and criticized the expensive and complicated kitchen planning in Germany. Quote, it is gleaming of chrome, diverse engines are roaring, and everything is placed along the wall. Malicious tongues call it the kitchen with a driver's driving license. The inhabitants of countries that invented and thought of the modern kitchen long before us make it much easier, cheaper, and just as practical. In 1967, appliance manufacturer Siemens was still critical of the condition of many German kitchens. Quote, 15% of all kitchens in Germany are absolutely unsuitable and 25 to 30% are still not satisfactorily, satisfactorily equipped. According to Siemens, this was due not only to the perseverance of consumers and the attitude of many young housewives, mother made, mother made it this or that way, which delayed the development, but also and above all to the wrong floor plan design. In general, both the industry and consumers argued in favor of larger kitchens with adjoining utility rooms and more generous floor plans, which would create the basis for the increased purchase of large electrical appliances and thus higher electricity consumption. There were fewer and fewer living kitchens in Germany. Numbers dropped from 54% of all German kitchens in 1960 to 39% in 1966. Only 45% of Germans wanted a modern kitchen with a dining area. 16% even wanted to do, even wanted to have a kitchen without it, and only 25% still advocated a combinated kitchen and living room. The larger the place of residence and the higher the income, the more consumers tended to want a working kitchen. So now I'm going to um, conclude. Um, and try to wrap things up. So the long 1960s were a decisive phase in the development of the high energy society or the high energy regime in Germany. After the years of the economic miracle in 1957-58, the German consumer or energy consumer society developed during the 1960s under the influence of a growing range of appliances, falling prices and the ubiquity of electricity. In their more correct analysis and forecasts, the electrical industry and the electricity industry constructed the picture of an emerging affluent society whose consumption habits were closely linked to high energy consumption. The agents involved in energy consumption, including energy supply companies, the electrical industry, politicians and consumers, formed a wasteful coalition during the long 1960s. Visions of a life of material carelessness and hedonistic consumption became real. To be modern meant to consume more energy. The need to save energy was, if at all, remembered as a characteristic of a past and pre-modern era characterized by deprivation. While the early 1950s were characterized by rapidly growing consumer wishes, after 1957, more and more people were able to fulfill these. Now, the consumption of more and more energy became a matter of course and expectations of a probably free energy supply group. Above all, the nuclear euphoria of the 1960s seemed to guarantee uninterrupted economic growth and nourish the progress optimism of that decade. In the US, the highest increase in energy consumption was recorded between the late 1930s and the early 1970s, while Germany followed suit from the early 1950s onwards. During the 1960s, a high energy regime and the new energy systems were established in Germany and kitchens were an essential part of this. As a result of the two oil price crises in 1973 and 79, High private energy and especially electricity consumption were questioned from all sides. And I think this is important to have in mind regarding um, the current um, discourse on energy transitions. 
So um, I want to come to an end here finally, but uh, maybe also mention some, some questions uh, arising from, from my talk, from hearing um, the other talks so far. So um, my focus was on the electrification of urban kitchens, but of course it would be highly interesting to compare these findings to rural developments as well. Um, and I'm also interested, especially in the role of museums and the question how exhibitions foster behavior, behavioral change, um, for example, in, in terms of, of energy saving. Um, yeah, just two um, thoughts I, I had in mind. But um, yeah, now I want to come to an end. Thank you. So, if you thank you very much. Really, really engaging, and those topical questions are, are really pressing so thank you very much for, for bringing them to our attention so we're going to use the um, Q&A function if people already uh, have started asking questions which is great and I will relay the questions so that um, our speakers can can hear them very clearly um, um, and please do keep on adding to these questions um, but I think maybe I'll start with Kathleen although the most recent question is one that's addressed to both of our speakers and it's about the relationship between modern technology and forms of modern design, which you both touched upon in your talks. So Kathleen's question is really quite direct in that it's asking a question about what is the relationship between modern technology and modern design, say in the Cornell kitchen or in German white goods. So Barbara, would you have any thoughts upon that? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Kathleen, for the question. Um, I think perhaps what really struck me um, when I was doing the research for the Cornell Kitchen was to what extent the um, electrical companies were actively promoting um, electrical appliances at this time. Um, their, forms of promotion were actually incredibly aggressive. And perhaps, um, you know, we should give more attention to actors uh, like electrical goods companies, which were sponsoring research um, and General Electric in particular seemed to have sponsored most university um, research projects into kitchens during this period. Um, and perhaps the emphasis should shift slightly away from the role of the designer and more towards their behind the scenes um, influence over the kinds of technologies which were being promoted through these projects. Great, thanks Barbara. Sophie, do you have any thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I think it was quite the same in, in, in Germany, just as, as Barbara said, maybe everything happened a bit later, but um, yeah, I also think that it was like, um, 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 yeah, it depended on each, the, the um, developments depended on each other, so without um, the modern design of a kitchen, no modern technology in the kitchen, and uh, the other way around uh, and that's why um, I think this close cooperation between uh, utilities and um, appliance manufacturers and also kitchen experts um, were important during this um, decades. Mm. If it's okay I might go to Maria's question because it connects with that point. So this is the first question we have. Um, so this is really addressed to Barbara, I think. In the transition from the home economist's use and user-centered design approach, working from the inside out, as you said, to the emphasis on aesthetics and appearance that was brought in by architects, have you found any reference to that in terms of where design expertise is seen to reside? Or discussions of what design actually is understood to be? Did a use and user-centered design process as brought in from home economics in any way challenge to then establish foundations and methodologies of design a la Bauhaus? 
It's a great question. And honestly, I could spend half an hour answering that. Um, but perhaps to begin with the first question, it is important to say that home economists did not, for the most part, claim design expertise. Um, and, and in fact, they were quite clear that they did not see themselves working as designers. Instead, um, they saw their role as being to establish through their research principles or standards that they would then turn over to consumers or to architects and engineers um, and commercial firms to apply. Um, and so this is why I think their influence on post-war architecture is often not evident. They really saw themselves operating as mediators, as middlemen or middle women in this case, and they did tend to remain in the background. Um, sexism also played a part here. They were very rarely invited to share a platform with male architects. Um, so for instance, Bayer uh, was frequently invited to other universities or to MoMA to discuss the Cornell Kitchen. And these invitations were almost never extended to his female collaborators, which, and, and they'd been vital to shaping the project. Um, so just to say, I, I don't think Home economists had or even sought a direct relationship with architects, but modernist architects did nonetheless absorb many of their principles, and you see this from Gropius to the Eameses. Um, and ironically, we now attribute many of the home economists' principles to those architects. So it's very common to see the Eameses credited with many principles that they clearly uh, took and absorbed from the home economists. That's fascinating. Sophie, that just makes me think a little bit about your talk because the figure of the architect and designer does not feature very strongly in your narrative. But for many design historians, Schutter Lihotsky's Frankfurt Kitchen would be this kind of icon of a certain sort of scientific managerial approach to design. So do, do German architects post-war pay attention to the kitchen? Do designers have things to say or is this a discourse in which they're relatively minor figures? Uh, no, absolutely. Um, um, they they are part of, of the discussion. So I'm, I'm not a design historian, unfortunately. So I have not um, um, the bigger picture of, of this and the insight into uh, the discussions among architects. But um, yeah, they, they pop up here and there. And uh, for example, um, as I've mentioned briefly, um, in terms of um, the profession as a gender profession, for example. So um, it is criticized that architect, uh, architects are mainly uh, male. So um, they seem to be, seem to have no idea of uh, what it means to work in a kitchen, which um, is, is criticized by uh, the female experts. There were some female experts in the field as well, of course. Um, yeah, but the the Schutter Lihotsky example, of course, it's it's very famous, and uh, you have those um, kind of working kitchens also in in, in social housing mm. um, a lot in in West Germany and in Austria as well. But um, it seems to me that they uh, did not, um, yeah, connect to this discourse of the nineteen twenties after the war because um, the rationalization, the aspect of rationalization was 
there in the first years and was important in the first years after the war. But then uh, it seems to me that everything um, got bigger and more and um, that there were, of course, studies on, on kitchen work and um, stuff like that, just as we have also seen for, for the other examples for the other countries. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it wasn't about rationalization, but um, it tended to, um, sorry, I don't have, have the word right now, it tended to be a discussion about uh, selling more, um, selling more electricity, more appliances, stuff like that, but not be um, rational. In fact. Thank you. I'm going to pick up Deborah Sagrian's question here, and initially it's addressed to, to Sophie, but actually I think it could also be a question for Barbara too, and it's really about class. So Barbara, I'll give you the question, oh. the quick version, and then we'll go straight to Sophie. So does the Cornell kitchen have a class dimension? And then Sophie, the question directly from Deborah is, was separating cooking from eating and living seen as a matter of social status? For instance, living dining kitchens seen as old fashioned or maybe lower class. Um, in, in the Cornell kitchen, um, it, it, class is complicated because these were farm families. Mm. Um, most likely, many of them would have defined or self-defined as middle class, but they were cash poor. Um, and so they, they don't really fit neatly into class in the same way that urban and mm. suburban uh, consumers may well have done. Um, they also, for the most part, they already owned homes. And so the Cornell kitchen, it, um, it was implicitly meant to be a living kitchen. Um, but that was because they were working with these very large rambling farmhouses and trying to fit compact kitchens into existing uh, dining room spaces. Mm, thank you. And Sophie? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I'm also hesitant to um, say something about, about class, but there's definitely, definitely um, a connection between um, aspects of modernity, urbanity, um, high energy consumption, and the working kitchen, but not uh, the rational working kitchen we know from Schütte-Lihotsky, but um, a bigger uh, laboratory, mm. um, a bigger kitchen, bigger working kitchen, which is um, separated from uh, the dining room. Um, yeah, so I would say if you, if you have a look into the statistics, you can see that um, people with a higher income tend to have um, a working kitchen in the 1960s. Um, but I'm also hesitant to, to really make a statement about class because, as Barbara said, in, in a rural area, this discussion mm. would be um, absolutely different than, um, mm. than for the cities. So, yeah, that's not easy to answer. Mm. Thank you. Um, this is from Grace and it's to Barbara. Barbara mentioned that the version of the Cornell kitchen which went to market lacked user-centered features such as height adjustable sinks. Please can Barbara say something about costing for these adjustable mm. features and accessible pricing of a new kitchen at the time? Um, I can try, uh, but this was something that buyer was constantly being uh, asked as well. Uh, he repeatedly said that the aim was to produce the Cornell kitchen um, so that it would be roughly the same cost as your average a steel fitted kitchen. And I, I can't remember what that cost was, but it was something like $2,000. Um, but however, the plans were never really far enough advanced so that um, 
we could tell whether or not that pricing was realistic. Um, the thing that perhaps I should have mentioned but didn't is that it seemed that one of the stumbling blocks, one of the reasons why Cornell Kitchen wasn't mass produced by Westinghouse was that Westinghouse estimated that it would have cost uh, about a million dollars for them to retool their plants in order to produce the Cornell kitchen. And they were never convinced that they would recoup that million dollar investment. Mm -hmm. So even more than the eventual unit price, I think there was this uh, issue of what it would have cost to um, adapt manufacturing facilities to produce the kitchen in the first place. Mm. Thank you. Um, Yulia Statitsa, apologies if I've mispronounced your name, has got a question that I suppose in some ways touches upon economics and it's again for Barbara. Was kitchen design and optimization at Cornell linked as well with other types of rationalization such as food consumption? imposing in these ways more scientific consumption patterns, for instance. So about shaping behaviors, I suppose. Absolutely. Um, and one of the reasons uh, why I think Cornell, the Cornell name had such magic in the field of kitchen studies is that it was there uh, very well established as a center of nutritional research. And I don't know if you caught in some of my slides, but you could see, for instance, Cornell milk and mm. Cornell bread. Cornell bread was quite a big thing. It was a special uh, formulation, um, scientifically enhanced for health. And so, I, I think that when um, viewers in the 1950s were looking at photographs of these housewives in their kitchen preparing food, they would have um, had these associations um, with uh, good health, good nutrition, um, and, and they particularly those uh, every single publicity shot seemed to have an image of children drinking milk and eating sandwiches. So definitely it, it was part of a much larger program to ensure the health of farm families. Presumably Sophie one could reflect in the same way about the German context. This is about energy consumption but it's tied into other consumption patterns, uh, trying to produce new norms, new behaviors in German society. Would you see it in those terms? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So um, also patterns of um, also food consumption uh, changed in the 19, uh, 1950s and 60s. Uh, for example, in terms of um, freezing, so you were able to um, buy more and then freeze it or um, uh, so the whole pre-serving was, was easier, so you could uh, adapt your uh, eating habits, uh, for example, and also you had all those smaller appliances, which made some um, preparation techniques much easier, so you were um, able to prepare, um, yeah, like maybe more interesting dishes uh, for, for dinner, um, but the thing also was, um, which is kind of um, a paradox song, is that um, you were using more and more electric appliances and uh, they were said to save you some work and time. But in fact, um, the notions of a good meal changed. So uh, it got even more work to prepare this good meal um, with the introduction of more and more electrical appliances in the kitchen. This is um, quite the same um, for uh, hygiene standards, which um, grew and got um, different and 
the, your shirt had to be even whiter. And so you had a washing machine, an electric washing machine, but um, it made work easier, but you had to wash it more often, for example. Mm. So there are funny um, numbers for how often Germans change their um, underwear, for example. <laughs> of course, uh, yeah, this was also changing during this time due to the introduction of um, yeah, so many electric appliances in mm. the household. So I'm starting to get a picture. We're not just thinking about networks of electricity, but we start to think about about materials, food production, and so on, and much bigger kind of macro shifts that, that mm -hmm. are occurring at this time. This is a question to both of you, from Claire and Mahoney. In the light of um, the thoughtful transnational elements of electrical manufacture and dissemination raised by you, might you both tell us more about how researchers and firms collaborated or rivaled each other in adapting mm -hmm. appliances to distinct electricity current regimes on either side of the Atlantic? So I suppose a bit about knowledge transfer there. Were there distinct challenges, both of a technological nature as well as a, of cultural habits of use in play? Barbara. It's a great question. I must say, I would need to do more research to be able to answer that. Um, as David was reading the question, I was thinking, oh, it is interesting. Cornell Kitchen was very widely uh, disseminated. Um, and, and there seemed to be this endless fascination with it, but it was disseminated mainly through newspapers, so through the mass media, um, through uh, other home economic uh, research centers, um, and also through architects. Um, I have not seen any evidence that it was really disseminated through more technical literature. Um, I do know that Bayer entered into quite a long correspondence with the uh, researchers at the Building Research Institute in the UK, and maybe they went more into technical details, but it, it didn't seem to go that deep. From what I've seen, but it's it's an interesting question. And so, if in a way you touched upon this in your talk because of the Cold War context, um, but do you have any particular thoughts here about this this sense of knowledge exchange or rivalry and competition between companies and so on? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, regarding knowledge transfer, of course, the the Germans um, saw. An ideal, for example, in the in the American kitchen, uh, not only because it was a kitchen uh, with, um, yeah, a lot of appliances and um, high energy consumption, um, and yeah, also the North European countries, for example, the Swedish kitchen was was a big, um, a big role model for uh, Germans when um, it came to to um, creating a, a new style of kitchen in Germany and um, I also think there were of course challenges to, to introduce um, such a high amount of, of electricity in, in the kitchen but um, it wasn't like um, in, in the beginning of the 20th century when electricity was an absolutely uh, new uh, thing to have at home and maybe you were kind of fearful of it and you didn't know how to work with it and um, the problem was it was invisible so uh, it appeared like like magic and you had to make it um, uh, visible which was um, good for uh, utility companies later on because uh, because it is invisible you lose you lose touch of how much you consume. Uh, okay, but this is uh, too far away from the original question. Well, um, I think a comparative uh, study would be um, mm. very, very uh, useful here and to, to trace the, the paths of um, um, knowledge transfer uh, regarding yeah, electricity consumption um, across the ocean, maybe. Um, and maybe 
also would be interesting to have a closer look at the exhibitions in, in West Germany uh, in the 1950s where you had the American kitchen um, built up and there were um, actors um, mimicking the housewife and um, uh, her husband and the kids and German people could walk in and uh, uh, have a look how the original American kitchen looks like and maybe uh, even the Cornell kitchen appears in some of those. I'm not sure if uh, the Cornell kitchen made it uh, across the ocean. But um, yeah, I mean, so I'm very interested in, in researching further in, in, uh, in those exhibitions because the role of museums and exhibitions is especially important, even uh, important, yeah, especially in the 50s. But it raises a question about the spectacular nature of these things. Yeah. Oh. The American technology is highly visible around the world, but whether consumers always saw this in good positive terms is another question. And some of that research on those propaganda exhibitions during the Cold War described mm -hmm. fascination, but also a kind of um, a kind of disdain of what was seen as a rather kind of vulgar culture, which is kind of curious. Barbara, that sort of relates to the question yeah. I have. We're coming towards the end, so if people have final questions, please do add them in. And Eleanor, I've not forgotten. Um, I was very interested in, in Bayer's position as you described it, because it seemed to me that in, in one sense he wanted to materialise and he wanted to engage with um, manufacturers because of, to substantiate the project, but at the same time found the commercial drive in uh, American uh, uh, electrical goods kind of difficult to manage and I wondered whether he would be understood as a as a critic of the of the world of the American kitchen or whether he was in some sense a kind of modernizer or a progressive force how would you put him in relation to those manufacturers um it... <laughs> He's quite an interesting character because I would describe him as the quintessential technocrat. Mm. Um, and for those of you who know Aaron Dam Duta's monumental study of MIT um, and the turn to technoscience mm. during those years, um, you'll see that Duta says that economists really um, were at the apex of power in terms of university research in, in these years. And it is somewhat curious that Bayer is an economist with no design expertise at all, um, but yet he's clearly the mastermind of this project. Um, he is absolutely, um, assiduous or, or he's incredibly careful about expressing views or he, he's so neutral mm. all the time. And I looked at hundreds of letters that he wrote and I, I just found him quite a fascinating person. He was a technocrat, mm. like from the top of his head to the tip <laughs> of his toes. So he was a really representative uh, type, I think, that emerged in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Um, he must have felt intense frustration um, over the course of the Cordell Kitchen's development because I think it must have become evident to him at some point that corporations were not just simply going to adopt his scientifically improved designs um, and that corporations did not act in the public interest. Um, but he never really let that facade slip um, and he persisted. Um, and persisted until the end of his life in 1966. So he actually never formally renounced his market-oriented model. Mm. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, we've got one final question, and it's, it's a kind of an open one. It's to Barbara again. Um, 
This is from Eleanor Peters. I'm currently researching the marketing of electricity in rural Scotland during the interwar years, and I was struck by your comment that the modernisation of kitchens was used as a selling point to keep people from migrating um, from rural to urban areas. Could you say anything further about this from a North American perspective? Um, in America, I believe in 1900, 50 percent mm. of the population was rural, so lived in rural areas. And by 1950, um, that figure was down to 15 percent. And so there was tremendous concern. And again, what I think is sometimes forgotten by historians today when they look back on the post-war period is they, um, or very often it's forgotten how preoccupied the government was mm. with rural migration, mm. how concerned they were by that, um, and how much of the funding for housing research actually was initially directed towards the problem of rural housing specifically. Um, and, and those involved in urban issues were constantly complaining about this. They felt quite left out and neglected. Um, and so the, the main issue was uh, felt to be that rural areas um, had aging housing stock um, and also comparatively low standards of living. And so I, I think you need to understand that in order to really appreciate the Cornell Kitchen's effort to, um, you know, remedy this situation in a single design. Um, it was all bells, all whistles, and it promised to do everything um, to improve the lot of rural families. Mm. Thank you, that was very helpful. Sophie, you have a point. Yeah, yeah and uh, just a question for, for Barbara, which uh, came up uh, for me, because um, you've mentioned uh, the, the average uh, woman or the average housewife, and I know you're interested in, um, in bodies as well. And so um, my question would be, uh, how did they, um, get an idea of what the average housewife uh, or the average woman is. So were there specific studies or statistics they used? Um, in terms of that figure, the five foot four mm. inch woman, they made that up. Um, but, and they, they made it, they settled on it as a compromise. They were aware that they needed to work with some kind of average, but their preference whenever possible was to customize designs so that it would fit the individual users. So they always tried to work with individual women's work curves and they you know, they have all these famous diagrams um, where they trace out individual women's uh, reach and, and dimensions. So their preference was for an even more highly customizable kitchen than what the Cornell kitchen. The Cornell kitchen, I think, um, is really an example of mass customization rather than standardization. But um, e even that was a step too far for many of the home economists who really wanted each individual kitchen to be constructed by the homeowner um, around the operator, the housewife, um, to exactly suit her uh, measurements. And um, so, and this is part of the, the reason for the tensions that emerged uh, between Bayer and his collaborators. 
who felt the Cornell kitchen just simply didn't go far enough. Thank you. Well, this format's always a bit tricky. I'd normally be saying any further questions, but people would be typing them. So uh, I think probably we should draw it to close, but thank our two speakers for really, really excellent, fascinating talks uh, that have uh, triggered lots of thoughts in me and I'm sure in everybody listening. So we appreciate that greatly. And thank you, Sorsha, for organizing the session. Um, at three o'clock today, there'll be a further session looking at Canada and Spain. So it's a warm encouragement to return this afternoon if you can. But in the meantime, I'd like to say thank you very much and uh, hopefully see you later. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.